It's a pleasure to welcome back to uh, WDHA, Jerry Beckley. Good morning. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Nice to see you. A brand new self-titled album that seems odd to say self-titled after all the solo albums that you've done. Uh, the album, Jerry Beckley, that's just been out a couple of weeks now. It's a wonderful collection of tunes, Jerry. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm proud of it. Title just came from, uh, frankly, we didn't have an alternative at the time. You know, easier to remember if it's your own name. One of the things that struck me as I've listened to the album is it reminds me a lot of some of the more introspective pieces from Tom Petty's Wildflowers album. I'm thinking songs like Wake Up Time, Crawling Back to You. It seems like it would be a nice companion piece to that record. Uh, I should be so lucky. It's one of my favorite records of all time. And uh, I don't know how much you know about that album, but Rick Rubin produced that for Tom. And and one of the things, apart from just being a great start to finish album, but there are so many beautiful layers in that album, songs that sound incredibly simple. But if you get your headphones on and listen there, there might be 10 or 20 things that you didn't realize are going to present what you're just taking as a nice little tune. I love that record. And it'd be an honor to be in that same company. You mentioned Rick Rubin and not to belabor the Tom Petty point, but he talked about the title track. And he yeah. said that uh, in the documentary, he was talking about how it sounds on the surface, like just Tom and a guitar, like a solo yeah, acoustic recording. Go. But you mentioned the layering and that is so important because when you listen to it and much the way some of the tracks on your album, the layering of just voices and different instrumentation is incredible. Thank you. I, I think that's the art in the craft. Uh, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at that. But what I always say is I grew up, Dewey and I both grew up kind of in an era of listening in headphones. We used to put on Bridge Over Troubled Water and just listen to this beautiful stereo pan positioning and all the things that you can really discover by getting the headphones on and stuff. So I've always tried to make it a listening experience. That doesn't let you off the hook about better be a good song, better be a great lyric, you know. But it's how do you present it? And and I think uh, I think it came out pretty good. You mentioned headphones. I can't tell you how many hours I spent listening to America Records with headphones on, trying to pull your three voices apart. Yours was the easiest of the three to pull. Um, Dan and Dewey, I had a little bit more trouble with. But I, I basically learned how to sing harmony from listening to your records, from trying to pick the voices out. Thank you. And also, I've heard a lot of people learned acoustic guitar from those early albums. You know, the Dewey songs in particular... First album, Riverside, Three Roses, stuff like that was really, first of all, obviously a, a dream to play and be a part of all of that. But as you, well, if you sing harmony, you know, it's all about the blend. You know, you can have three voices all singing the right notes, but if they don't have the blend, it's, it doesn't work. One of the things I didn't realize as I was going through some stuff is you started out in surf bands. Yeah, both of us did. We didn't know each other at the time, but Dew was a big fan of Dick Dale. And I was in a group I remember called the Vanguards. And I think surf band was just a way of saying nobody sang, you know, <laughs> because um, we were all Ventures fans and all of those instrumentals, Pipeline, Walk, Don't Run, all of that stuff was some of the earliest guitar stuff you learn, you know, when you get an electric guitar. So, yeah, that's uh, that's a great memory. I went back to the Billboard chart from November of 1963, and I found a bunch of different artists on there like The Four Seasons, Dion. Uh, Jan and Dean, the Beach Boys. So there, there's rock and roll in there, a lot of it with that surf element, if you will. And then yeah. all of a sudden, here are the Beatles coming yeah. in February of 1964, just a few weeks later, and everything changes. How did that night hit you? Well, it hit me like all from my generation. I think you, it doesn't matter who you interview, they will say that was a life-changing moment. I've heard Tom Petty say that in interviews uh, Andrew Gold, who was a dear friend, we lost. But yeah, it's it's uh, impossible to overstate the impact of that. It all of a sudden, I mean, and I was a huge music fan. I was at Beach Boy albums and actually some folk records and stuff. But it was a game changer. It, it, the way I explain it to kids who obviously were not there at the time was if you imagine Elvis Presley was the biggest star in the world and stuff. What if you had four Elvises in a band, you know? And each one kind of played off the other and they had they had jokes and harmonies and things. You know, I run out of ways to describe it, but obviously um, it, it charted the course for myself. From that moment on, it's like, oh, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. You know, 
so many people did. I think Steve Van Zant in his uh, recent documentary said February 8th, nobody was in a band. February 9th, <laughs> nobody was in a band. February 10th, everybody was in a band. <laughs> yeah, right. Everybody's combed their hair different. And yeah, I know it was, it was really great. And, you know, one of the things about being my age or near my age is that we have memories of that. I mean, memories are a wonderful thing. They're not always as, as beautiful as that. There's some tragic things that were occurring at that time. And so I've, they're all in the mix with it. But I can tell you, I knew about the Beatles because I'm half English. My mother is English. We would go back and forth to England every summer. And it was obviously, you know, six months earlier, it had blown up wide in the UK. So we were kind of just waiting for, well, how come we don't know about this? When, oh, believe me, it's coming. And as you probably know, many, many years later, we ended up with George Martin, who was at the helm for all of those albums. So, yeah, I've got some uh, got some amazing memories. One of the other things we were talking about, the comparison, I thought, between the Wildflowers, Tom Petty album and your album. And I hear a little bit, speaking of the Beach Boys and surf music, I hear a little bit of Holland and uh, and the Surf's Up album. And again, going back to the layering, I know you had worked with Carl Wilson and I believe Bruce Johnston. Um, how much of an effect did you have or did the Beach Boys have on you when it came to songs like what are on this new album? Well, obviously a major effect. Um, uh, you know, I cut my teeth on all of that stuff. They sang, Carl and Bruce sang on our third album, I think. And then I sang on Beach Boys stuff. I was doing an interview with um, Endless Summer, one of the Beach Boy fan things. And they were asking me what it was like to be on Sail on Sailor. And I said, you know, I don't think I'm on that. I knew I was on Holland that, you know, we went to the studio in Holland, but we didn't sing with them at the time, but we knew them all very well. And we were in the studio the record wasn't finished. They came back, they went into the village recorders in Santa Monica and we were cutting some of Ricky Fatar and Blondie's stuff. And I kind of spaced out and they said, no, you're on sale on sale. I had the track sheet right in front of me and there's like Billy Hinchy and there's my name. So now when I listen to it, I go, oh, yeah, I am, I am on that. But it's just an indicator of, how hectic those times were, you know, you can be on something that monumental and kind of forget it. You know? That song in particular and Long Promised Road are two of my favorite Beach Boys songs from that era. Um, you know, I want to go just to get back to Carl quickly, both on Surf's Up, it, it, two of his true masterpieces, you know, Fuel Flows and Long Promised Road. Uh, I, you know, obviously, I think, you know, my connection with Carl, but uh, I can never tire of listening to that. It's just beautiful stuff. I love the choice that you made um, of all of the songs on here when you stepped away from your own material of Fred Neal's Everybody's Talking. Yeah. Why that song? Well, it's, you know, it's very close to being one of those, you don't touch stuff like that. You know, Harry's is, of course, the definitive version. <clears throat> we all knew we loved Harry. I was just messing with it one day, and there's some lovely little subtle things that happen in the inversions of those chords. And before you knew it, I had a kind of a track going, and I'm singing along. So I don't think anybody will will um, question that I'm, I'm coming from the right place to do that track. But there's not a part of me that's saying, oh, OK, you think that's great. Wait till you hear my version. There's no, <laughs> there's no way that I would ever attempt. You know, Harry was the great voice of our generation. And anyway, it's a lovely song and I'm happy I included it. One of the things that has always amazed me, Jerry, about songwriters is they'll write a song and then it'll disappear for a while. They'll put it away and maybe they even forget about it. The Smithereens did an album uh, 30 years ago and just released it a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, we forgot about this. Your first single off this album sat around for 10 years and then yeah, all yeah. of a sudden, hey, wait a second. How does that happen where you just all of a sudden feel, well, it's not right 10 years ago, but now it is. You know what? First of all, nod to Jeff Larson, who's my co-producer on a lot of these projects, but he started out as our archivist. And what that meant was we all had all masses of computers. And he said, well, let me clone them all. And I'll start going through and just make sure that we file everything in the right. You know, this is America stuff. This is some demos to do it. And there were numerous times when you'd be on the road and you might be out for two weeks and you finally come home on a Monday and you might not be flying again till Thursday. And I had a full studio in the, at my house at the time. And you go in and you get all enthused and you cut something. And you're a little bit jet lagged and tired and stuff. Well, this is exactly what happened with crazy. And then you go out on the road for another three or four weeks and you've forgotten about it. Come home, you do something else. You work on another five songs. Crazy is one of those ones that just kind of slip between the cracks. And Jeff 
you know, last year said, oh, I found this. This sounds pretty good. You know, like, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, and so obviously it was nowhere near done. We had a lot of work to do with it. And and our dear friend, Brian Eichenberger from the Beach Boy Band, he he helped massive amounts of vocal harmonies and stuff. So I'm really happy with how it came out. Well, I like the new album a whole lot. Self-titled Jerry Beckley. You can find all things Jerry Beckley on his website at jerrybeckley.com. Jerry, thank you so much for your time this morning here on WDHA and best of luck with the new record. My pleasure, man. Nice talking with you.